a number of us, uh, Claire Wathan, Himena, Alice, uh, and other members of our team have been absolutely um, touched to be able to support and host our community in um, exploring the different topics that we have uh, over these past few months. And today, as we bring this to a close, uh, we're really glad to come back to the beginning in a way and to come back to uh, home, um, which is a theme that we've been exploring with the absolutely wonderful duo of Parker Palmer and Sharon Salzberg. We're gonna be turning it over to them in just a tiny moment, but we just wanted to share with everyone what would be happening next in this series. So we're bringing this particular series to a close and in July, we'll be focusing on regional sessions. Um, so we'll be looking to tailor those for the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, um, Asia, which is where we're seeing uh, a really significant need for support uh, at this moment in time. And then we'll be back more generally in the fall with a year long series. And we will be seeing uh, this wonderful duo again uh, in uh, a number of lovely ways. As we go through today's session, uh, a quick reminder, if you have any feelings or questions that come up along the way, we're really glad to welcome those into the chat. Uh, please type those in. We'll be paying attention to those uh, questions and we'll bring those forward and share them uh, with both uh, our uh, two wonderful guests today. Parker, Sharon, thank you for joining us again. It's a gift to have you with us. And as we bring this series to a close, and what we're doing is bringing it to a close in a time that remains uncertain, that remains difficult, that remains complex, and where we continue to need to tend to ourselves. And so I'd love to start by putting the question to you both. What do you think is the most important way or ways that we can pay attention to ourselves in this moment in time? And Sharon, maybe we could start with you. Okay, thank you. Well, I've been thinking a lot about just the nature of conditioning and uh, the inputs I've been having throughout my life, as, as we all do. And it also came up for me when uh, you mentioned that this was the last one. And I thought about, of this particular series, not the last one forever, but I thought about when uh, Jack Cornfield and I were teaching together in various spots around the U.S. And this was before any of the centers came into being. So what would happen would be we'd be together for 10 days with a group of people. We'd create a world and then it would be over. And Jack and I had completely different responses to that. Like I'd say to him, let's stay through lunch. You know, maybe a few people will linger. Let's not, let's not go right away. And he'd say, let's go out. <laughs> you know, Time to go. Like it's over. Time to go. Uh, and I thought, oh, we just had very different backgrounds or very different kinds of conditioning around letting go or around endings, around transition really is probably a more accurate term. So I have been thinking a lot about conditioning and all kinds of different ways. And I often think about this uh, quotation from the American writer, Maya Angelou, who said something like, um, when, I knew, when I knew better, I did better which I think places uh, the realization in the right place. Like we don't know better, you know, or we're caught up or we're overwhelmed or we get reckless or something happens so that as we look back at certain actions, we have a kind of regret or remorse. And, and yet it's not this sort of innate part of our being. We're not like bad, you know, uh, because when we know better, we do better. And I also think about, again, on the note of conditioning, the many kinds of influences, uh, the myths I've incorporated, the stories told about me or my kind of person or, uh, you know, the, the things that I've just imbibed in some way that distort my vision and uh, even very contemporary ones. Like I, I recall this time I was in Jerusalem actually, and I was walking through the old city in the marketplace and it's, you know, just these narrow alleyways teeming with goods. And um, and as I was walking around, this merchant called out to me, oh, I have what you need. And I stopped and like this thrill went through my entire body. 
And I thought, oh, he has what I need. And I, I sort of turned to him and I thought, wait a minute. First of all, I don't need anything. And second of all, how would he know he has what I need? But those voices come at us all of the time. And this is what you need to be a fulfilled person, to be a good worker, to be you know successful. And we do tend to incorporate a lot of them. And I think that's one of the best gifts I've gotten from kind of the meditative process or just that kind of introspection is to step back and say, do I really need that? Or what's that about? You know, or, uh, you know, that was useful the first 10 years, but, you know, maybe it's time to let that one go. And, and so that's really what I think about in terms of being able to let go of those influences that aren't that useful and in effect, forgive ourselves for what we've done when we've been kind of more lost or we didn't see things so clearly. Sharon, sure. I wonder if you might have a practice uh, <clears throat> around this that could make sense. Sure. Um, it's, it's kind of a reflection, which I think is really, it's helped me a lot, you know, so uh, if you want to sit comfortably, you can close your eyes or not. And I would just see if something arises for you as a voice you heard externally or something you've believed that you pretty well know is not that useful anymore. A sense of limitation or a sense of uh, no limits, you know, like boundless energy, you can do anything. Just see if something arises as a kind of thread that has influenced you, helped determine actions, but also you now look at and think, not so great for the future, you know, well worth letting go of. And if something arises or maybe a particular regret arises, Place it on a vehicle. Maybe it's a boat that's going to go down a river. Maybe it's a, the basket of a hot air balloon that's going to float up into the air. And feel what it's like not to hate that or, uh, you know, endlessly ruminate about it, but really just to recognize it, recognize the distortions we buy into, let it float away, let it float away and see what that feels like. Maybe other actions will start to arise along that spectrum of remorse or regret. <clears throat> and recognize it's not laziness or um, it's not making an excuse for yourself. It's actually having the ability to move on. Let it float away. Let it float away. If you want to put it in a rocket, let it blast off, but happily, not, you know, not angrily. So in doing that, we're no longer identifying totally with this particular thought pattern or trait or action. Recognizing it's part of a bigger picture of who we are, not collapsing into it. And that frees us to have a sense of a new beginning.
So thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Parker, um, I'm wondering if you might also like to weigh in on this question. Well, yeah, thanks, uh, Aaron, and, and thank you, Sharon. Those exercises are always so helpful for me. And one of the things I don't do that I should be doing is to take time for such things. Um, I've never had a vendor say to me, I have what you need. Um, if you could give me that person's address, I'd, <laughs> I'd like to go there. Um, I, I, back in the olden days when we went to restaurants and, and a server came to the table, um, that, you know, they would bring your food and then they would often say, is there anything else I can get you? And I would say, this is going to take some time, so please sit down. Um, you could get me a friend, you could get me a little gratitude, you know, you could get me a loan. Let's talk. Um, so I have had kind of that experience. But the whole, the whole business of letting go of all of that neediness uh, that leads one to have that fantasy about a server at the table um, really intrigues me because we all know on some level that, that letting go <clears throat> is, the, is something we really need to do and that forgiving ourselves is integral, an integral part of that. Um, and I think there's probably a million things to be said about why we often, at least many of us, find it hard to forgive ourselves. Um, I'm very fond of a poem about an interview that Robert Frost once gave, in which he was asked if he had hope for the future. And he said, oh yes, I do. I even have hope for the past, that it will turn out to have been better than, than I thought it was or think it was. And I, I think what he's talking about is how we tell the story of our past. And that has a lot to do with something you said, Sharon, about do we, do we understand that for the most part, we did the best we could with what we had at the time. Um, for the last 25 plus years, I've been, um, dad, essentially, to a granddaughter. Um, and um, as, I've, as I've played that role of father in my uh, 70s and, and uh, 60s, 70s, and now 80s, I've realized how much better I am at it than when I was raising my own kids. And of course I am. My life is more settled. Um, I, I don't have to be out there proving myself now in all the ways I did back then. Um, a lot has, uh, I have nothing left to prove in the big world, wide world of, of work. So I'm not as obsessed about that as I was when I was in my 30s and 40s. And it's, understanding that has really helped me accept myself as the father I was then, as contrasted with the father that I am now. Um, so I, I'm learning to tell my own story in a new way. Um, and, I, and I think exactly as you said, Sharon, that's, that's liberating. And if I can keep my eye on the fact that, uh, that at any given moment, I want to be as, as free as I can possibly be, as liberated as I can possibly be to offer the best that I have in this moment to the needs that are within my reach <clears throat> or the needs with which my gifts might intersect, uh, th then that's the way I want to live. Um, and since forgiveness, self-forgiveness is a big part of that, um, that's an art that I, I have to stay focused on. Um, I, I think in the midst of an active life, uh, that the kind of active life that most of us lead, we get so obsessed with whatever it is we're doing or trying to achieve that we do a lot of forgetting about critical things. Thomas Merton has a wonderful passage, a fairly famous pa passage about the violence of overactivity. 
and how it overactivity destroys the root of wisdom that makes all work fruitful. And, and part of that root of wisdom is embracing who we were then, who we are now, and whatever is emerging for us in a way that actually allows something good to emerge. So, so much, you know, that I'm, I, I could say about this, let me just say one more thing. For me, a bottom line in this kind of inquiry goes like this. There are certain gifts of presence and being and self-acceptance, forgiveness that I want to offer other people because it's pretty clear to me how much other people need those gifts. But if I can't receive those gifts for myself, there's no way in the world I can offer them to someone else. You know, I can, I can write a check if the need is money. <laughs> but if the need is forgiveness and I can't forgive myself, how can I possibly know enough about forgiveness to offer it to you? I, I can't. And so ultimately, anything that we can do, I think anything that we can do to care for true self, not, not to, to brush up ego self or you know, to satisfy greedy self, but anything we can do to care for true self is ultimately being done on behalf of the people whose lives we touch. And it's also true, you know, that in the Buddhist tradition, uh, which, you know, again, is very uh, exacting about the use of language, they, they make a distinction between remorse or regret on the one side and guilt on the other, whereas remorse or regret is considered wholesome and onward leading, and it's painful, but it's very positive because, you know, maybe we have said or done something or held back from saying or doing something and it's ripped the fabric of harmony somewhere, or it's really an expression of how little we think of ourselves and, and it's kind of gone outward or and it's painful to recollect that, but that pain in a way is how we move on. You know, mm -hmm. we recognize, I don't want to live there again and again and again, and it gives us some energy. And that's in contrast to guilt where we're just stuck. Right. We right. do identify with, whatever we did or said and it's all that we are and uh, i used the word collapse earlier it's really a collapse mm -hmm. and and we hold on and it's really a kind of lacerating self-hatred and it's considered unskillful or it's like useless you know because mm -hmm. it's only painful and it's not going to leave us with the energy to move on um, which is the point you know not to suffer uh from our own hand at, at what we have maybe wrought you know or done insufficiently or whatever, um, but to be able to move on in, in a more complete way. And as you say, that moving on is very impactful for others mm -hmm. as right. we, you know, as we change uh, in some way. So I, I really appreciated that because it's so easy as one recollects, well, you know, I didn't do enough or um, I did too much, <laughs> whatever it was, uh, as we look back to think, I can just stay there, you know, for a good long time. And, and it's actually not a useful, useful tendency. You know, it's better to feel the pain, love yourself anyway, and forgive yourself and move on. Absolutely. And uh, just a quick note about remorse and regret. It's certainly true for me that those can be healthy emotions to release stuff that needs releasing. But I, for me, the question always is, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Sharon, it, wh wh is that coming out of an idealized version of myself? Like when I was 40, I should have been perfect as a father. Because if it is, I think remorse and regret, even remorse and regret can be pathological. Yeah. So if I've, if I've adjusted my, my sights on the reality of who I was and what was going on for me back in the day, then re remorse and regret may be, may be a way to move forward. 
Yeah, I think that's great. And it's so interesting because um, I think if we talk, you know, uh, either make a list or draw a picture, as some people choose to do, of the circumstances we face right now and and what's actually happening, you know, in our uh, work, in our isolation, whatever the case may be, it's a lot going on. And you know, I think I think we need to be able to acknowledge that and not imagine that that perfected vision of sailing through, you know, like it's all going to be easy and not an easy time and nothing about it lends itself to to being easy. And yet, you know, we can navigate as best we can. Yeah, I, I get up every morning now and say, congratulations on getting up again. That's a good thing. That, that, that actually feels like a wonderful transition um, to another question. But I'll, I'll just say this, like even at a personal level, I love the reminder to keep being gentle with ourselves, to keep starting again. And we all have those moments where we can get worn thin and we can get snappy or a whole range of things. And so that invitation to keep coming back and forgiving ourselves and to starting again is such a wonderful invitation. Um, and Parker, you just, kicked off another area that would be wonderful to explore. How do we remember to really appreciate um, the good things that we've done? How do we remember to praise ourselves? Well, thank you for pointing that out because I didn't know I had done that, but that's, that's, that's very helpful. We, we get along with a little help from our friends. <clears throat> um, that wasn't a scripted moment because we don't script anything, right? It's just like it's against our nature. So, um, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> you modeled so well appreciating um, the fact that you woke up in the morning right. um, and got out of bed. And so like just taking that moment to just really appreciate that. And I think one of the things that um, just, how can we really appreciate, keep uh, front and center the good things about that, that we are, that we are doing, um, that was what you just, Right. Uh, it's so well, and so yeah, it's all coming back to me now. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I, I, I let me first revisit something that I said earlier in this series, but maybe it's worth revisiting. I, I think the heart of the answer to that question, Aaron, is that we have to relearn how to value little tiny things. Because one of the things that happens to us, especially those of us, and this would include, I think, most people on this call, who have been driven in our lives to try to accomplish something, uh, often in the realm of human service, uh, or in some way serving love, truth, and beauty, we live in a world which says only the big stuff you do around that is worth anything. So, you know, don't report in unless you've built a building or created a foundation or funded a multi-million dollar project or saved 10,000 lives. A thousand won't do, 5,000 won't do, 10,000 starts to interest us. We, that's the kind of world we live in. And I certainly went through a passage of my life when I was in you know, full power, full flower, when an achievement meant writing a new book, getting great reviews, you know, pleasing my publisher, selling like hotcakes. And if that didn't happen, then I just, you know, I had fallen short. And then, as I said earlier in this series, I started to have this experience of profound depression at several points in my life which happened partly, I think, because I was measuring the wrong thing. I was holding myself to a very artificial standard of, of what an accomplishment or a good life looked like. Um, and in the middle of maybe the second of, or third, I can't remember, of those three deep dives into depression, a therapist said to me, I want you to start keeping a journal of daily accomplishments. And I said, are you kidding? I, I 
can't even read a full page of a book without getting stuck on a paragraph and not knowing I was stuck until 40 minutes later, realizing I hadn't turned the page. I can barely get out of bed in the morning. And then he said, well, this is, this is my point. I want this to be a journal of tiny, tiny accomplishments. So on page one, you put a date and you say, got up this morning at 11 a.m. And maybe if you go bike riding that afternoon, you say, I rode my bike for five minutes. That's it, that's the page for that day. And then maybe on the next day or the day after it, as you look back through your journal, you will see that you say, you're saying, I got up at 10 a.m. this morning. That's an hour better than day one. I rode my bike for 15 minutes this afternoon. That's 10 minutes better than day one. And he said, you, it's important for you to start measuring these as accomplishments because you're in a place where each of those things is a success to be valued. And that, that really landed with me. I mean, at first, I didn't quite believe it, but I trusted this guy and he listened to me for a long time and I was willing to follow his advice and it helped. Among other things, it helped me see that what, what psychiatrists will often call the sawtooth pattern of depression, where you feel, ah, today I'm on my way to full health and then the next day you're down. There is a sawtooth pattern, but if you keep a tiny events journal of that sort, the, the, that saw blade takes a generally upward direction. And, and that's how it was with me. Um, depression needs all kinds of support from medication to talk therapy, maybe a change of circumstances, you know, depending on this, what you're dealing with in this very complicated disease, this complicated mental illness. But, you know, one of the things it needs is, is this kind of self-awareness uh, around um, the, the true state of your being and what's, what's actually happening to you and, and how to value those, the, the, your struggle in a way that doesn't, where you don't hold yourself to the old norms. And I, I learned a tremendous amount from that. Um, so that today, it's absolutely true that I, under current circumstances, I congratulate myself on getting up in the morning. I no longer have to journal about it. It's just an instinct. And that instinct goes to looking around the world and marveling at how many people did exactly the same thing this morning, despite circumstances that are much, much more dire than mine. So there's a, just as I talked earlier about my increased communal awareness that being 81 years old and with underlying conditions that put me at high risk for the virus, I, I have joined with a world full of people who live birth to death at high risk from pandemics of misogyny and racism and structural poverty and all the rest, just as I have a sense of unity with, with the folk in, at that level, I, I also have a sense of unity now with all the people who are, do, who are living their daily lives in, in invisibly heroic ways. And, and that's a hugely uh, fulfilling awareness for, for me to carry. So, uh, you know, the, the how-to of it, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that, that there are any tricks involved. I think it's just cultivating an awareness of what one is doing day in and day out that may have in one t at one point seemed absolutely ordinary, not even worth noting, but 
under current conditions is well worth noting and appreciating, not only in yourself, but others. Um, again, I think it's one of those things, if you can't do it for others, how can you do it for other people? How, you, how can you say, wow, I'm surrounded by a, a lot of walking miracles of, of people who are putting one foot in front of another in very difficult times. How, how can you appreciate that if you can't appreciate it in yourself? So, I don't know, maybe at this point, Aaron, that's the best, the best I can do with the, a good question. Parker, thank you. Um, Sharon? Well, I mean, I think one of the key uh, things that you said, Parker, was the word awareness. It's like, what do we pay attention to? Or what do we, what do we focus on? Where do we get hooked? And I kind of wish you hadn't used the example of an author with a book coming out where <laughs> it may not sell like hotcakes and they may not receive, receive universal praise, just noting that. Um, it will. But, We're see. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it is such a, a good example, really, because um, you think about the things that are out of your hand, and, and maybe you craft something, or you do a job, you you try to help somebody, and you put your heart into it, and you do the best you can, and somebody has another response, you know, other than the one that you want. And there's so much we cannot control, and and then we feel defective and we feel deficient. We like, it comes in and uh, reconfigures who we think we are and the story that we are telling about ourselves. Like I remember I wrote a book, um, I mean, I have so many book stories. Um, I wrote a book called Faith, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. Here's one story. And uh, there was a, a very major newspaper that was going to do a review and um, I was in California at the time about to fly back to the East Coast and uh, this was before you know a lot of things like I had a cell phone you know before that and, and I I called my messages at home and uh, someone the person who was going to pick me up at the airport uh, said I'm going to pick you up and oh by the way that review came out and I'm going to bring a copy of the paper to the airport to get you uh, and he said it was a pretty positive review except for a few remarks so then I had six hours on the airplane to think about what remarks were those like the positive review was gone it didn't even enter you know but it was like what we what comments were that what did they say and then I got there to the airport and he gave me the paper and the reviewer had taken extreme exception to the subtitle of the book it's not true it's not really about that it was totally about that but from my point of view you know you know and the entire review is about the subtitle which I did not even choose and I thought okay what are you going to do you know it was a hard book for me to write. It was an important book for me to write. You know, but that effort to be in control of every element of how it's received, I think is kind of natural and also unfortunate and well worth reminding myself, you know what? What's important is that you really put your heart here and you did it as well as you could. And it's going to help some people. And I think it's helped a lot of people, maybe not the reviewer, but, you know, it's, it's also fine. Uh, you know, that it's true. I think even evolutionary biologists say we're wired to look for danger, look for threat, look for what's wrong. And it takes, I think, a good amount of intentionality to look for what's right, to see the good, to see the good in ourselves. And it's actually a pretty classic Buddhist reflection, look for the good in yourself. And uh, I know that people feel squeamish about it. Like, I don't want to do that. That feels weird. It's too self glorifying or something, but it's not, you know, it's really, let's write the balance a little bit, or let's have a more truthful picture of who we actually are, not just the, the negativity, because it's consequential what we ruminate about what we ponder, where we put our attention, uh, it will make a difference. And nothing is served by our being exhausted and depleted and feeling so insufficient, like we could never do enough. And 
I think I'm going to start, you know, congratulating myself on waking up in the morning. I think that's a very good practice. Sure. It helps. It helps. I, if I could say one more thing about this um, before you turn back to Sharon. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a great um, country and Western music fan. And there's a, uh, a song, I think Billy Joe Shaver wrote it, that has a line in it that says, the, the devil made me do it the first time, the second time I did it on my own, um, which I've always, <laughs> I've always loved. Because I think the second time we do something that's self-undermining and self-defeating, it's, it's kind of a clue that maybe something in us is looking for an excuse not to, to try to, to strive and reach again. You know, it's a strange quirk of human nature that if I can find enough reasons uh, outside me or inside me, especially inside me, to believe that, you know, reaching for the stars or however you want to put it uh, is impossible. So I might as well just stop trying. If I can find something that, that blocks me from even trying, then I, I'm, I'm somehow a little more comfortable with my life. But if you can screw up and, and then do it again, <laughs> um, and, and sort of not count the consequences, because as you said, Sharon, you know that you put your best into this, your best intentions and your best gifts and skills at the time, that then I think, you know, we'll be okay. Thank you, Parker. Sharon, would you be up for leading us in another exercise around this? Sure, I might subject you to that. <laughs> Classic Buddhist meditation, please forgive me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you can sit comfortably, again, close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. If you like, you can settle your attention on the feeling of the breath as an anchor, as a way of arriving more fully in the moment. And see if you can recollect something good that you've done. Could be seemingly very small within the last two days, let's say. Thanking somebody, smiling at somebody, listening to somebody, even though they're maybe not very interesting. Asking someone how they're doing. And if you can think of nothing the fact that you're willing to contemplate this is a good thing. Or it may be an attribute within you. You tend to be forgiving. You tend to help others. Just see if something comes to mind and actually allow it to enter your awareness feel it in your body? What does it feel like to recollect this? You may feel, yuck, <laughs> this is embarrassing or this isn't right. And just notice that, see if you can let that float away. And come back to an appreciation. Bring someone else to mind, someone you consider caring or giving, or is in some way a kind of model for you. Think about the good within them. Think about something that they do as an action. And notice if it's easier to appreciate that.
and then come back to reflecting on the good within you or the good that you can aspire to in a meaningful way, something that really is a part of you. Remember, even doing this exercise counts. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end that session. Thank you, Sean. Maybe what we could do is invite people just to share any thoughts or reflections um, after that session, uh, after that practice into the chat. It would be lovely to hear from people that are up for sharing uh, what that was like. Um, Parker, there was one piece that you felt was really important to raise as a question as we look to how we tend to ourselves in these times. And the question was really about remembering and uh, being oriented towards continuing to learn. And I was wondering if you might be up for sharing with us um, a little about that. Yeah, well, it's a it's a piece of the perennial wisdom, I think, that um, hard things happen to human beings individually and collectively, but that if you're rightly oriented toward that, um, toward all of that, there's always something to be learned, and there's healing in learning, and there's empowerment in learning, and there's agency in learning. Um, for example, again, to revisit briefly something I said earlier, an early learning that I had in this pandemic was what it means to be in a high risk category for a condition that's sweeping an entire population. And while I had always, for a very long time in my adult life, felt profound empathy toward folk in the other kinds of pandemics I mentioned, racism, structural poverty, misogyny. Um, I don't think I ever really identified, learned to identify as fully with them as I have since this pandemic hit. And so, you know, that, that in, if I think about what was going on with me at the time, which wasn't a conscious, um, effort. It, I was, it was a grace in a way, but maybe a grace, the kind of grace that one tries to prepare to receive over the course of a lifetime. Um, it involved getting past my fear for myself pretty quickly um, as the pandemic came down and being able to see what what that pandemic was doing in terms of my sense of relatedness to the larger world. So that, that has proved to be a very important learning for me. It's, it's certainly one of the factors that has me, again, among the many in the United States who, who can personally identify with the I can't breathe motif and the Black Lives Matter motif that's, that's, that's being raised up in a nonviolent, a mostly nonviolent way on the streets of this country right now. Um, 
And, and so a learning like that, I think, you know, multiplies. And, and then I think, I, I was on a webinar the other day with a friend of mine who's written a book. His name is Ariel Berger. He's written a book about Elie Wiesel, who was his mentor for many years, my friend's mentor, uh, called Witness. And it's all about how Elie Wiesel taught in order that others might learn. And of course, all you have to do is mention the name Elie Wiesel, Nobel Prize winner who survived the Holocaust and, and life in a death camp to know that everything he had to teach came out of profound suffering, personal collective suffering. It's hard to look at or to learn about someone like Elie Wiesel or Viktor Frankl who wrote From Death Camp to Existentialism or any of the other amazing insights that have come out of the Holocaust experience. It's hard to look at those people and, and not realize that learning helps one transcend the most profound of horrors. So you know, one, you quickly have to say, th this is not book learning. <laughs> this is not the standard academic protocol for learning. Yes, facts and figures are involved, and yes, logic is involved, but it's learning that calls on the whole self. It's learning that involves our emotions and our relationships and our bodily knowing, as well as what goes on in the top half inch of our anatomy. Uh, I think once before I quoted the neurobiologist Candace Pert, who said, the brain may be located in the cranium, but the mind is located throughout the human body. And so this is, this is deep immersion, bodily learning, fully backed by science, you know, for, for those who who, who may uh, not like words like holistic or bodily. I mean, this has science behind it, folks, to say nothing of about a billion years of human wisdom. Um, so so um, this is just something I, that, uh, that I try to keep my eye on because it, it's, it's modeled, been modeled for me by some truly amazing people. And not all of them, of course, are well-known or famous names. I've personally known folks whose names will never be widely known, who endured great suffering in their personal, private, even societal lives, and emerged from that with wisdom that they imparted to others, never in a preachy way, you know, never, never in a, in a um, listen up way. They, they embodied it in their presence. And to quote my, my friend's book, the title again about, about Elie Wiesel, witness. They embodied it by witnessing. Um, and so learning is the thing for me. I think there are lots of things, people who would say learning is the thing for me too. And, and it's readily available, sort of in the instant. As, as soon as you get past one fear, we always come back to fear, right? It's such a fundamental part of the human condition. And the fear, I think, is for me at least, is this. If I open myself to learning what's to be learned here, about myself, about the world, and about the relation between the two. How might my life be changed? And am I going to be okay with that? Or is that learning going to take me to places I just as soon not go? You know, I, I know the ropes right now in the current circumstances of my life. It's working okay. Why would I want to be drawn into a whole new world in a, in, in a way that 
that, that suffering might open a world that suffering might open up to me. I just don't want to take the risk. So it's not a, always an easy path to just ask what's here to be learned, but I think it's a walkable path if we do it with our eyes open. Thank you, Parker. I'm hoping that I might be able to fit in one question from the, um, from the community. Uh, and Sharon, maybe I'll turn this question towards you. Um, Jasmine Pateja asks, I want to ask about the relationship between regret slash guilt and grief. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And I think I'll, I'll start by building on what Parker just said, and uh, which was very beautiful and somehow brought me back to the Buddhist psychology one more time where, um, first of all, fear and anger are considered the same mind state, just two different forms. Fear being the held in, frozen, imploding form. Anger being the energized, outflowing form of striking out against what's happening, wanting to declare it to be untrue. And one of the um, antidotes or one of the countervailing things to generate, of course, is loving kindness um, or tolerance. And another one is interest that... Uh, both the anger or the fear have us withdraw and interest has us kind of looking in a different way, you know, like coming closer to an experience. And um, we can, we can feel in every level of our being the difference. And I was just uh, recording a podcast with our mutual friend, Valerie Kaur, and who says, sends her love. And we were talking about, I said, I, I find myself very, interested in the people who uh, resent the term Black Lives Matter, because I'm wondering, what do they hear? Are they hearing only Black Lives Matter? Or are they hearing Black Lives Matter also, which would be a different level of problem, <laughs> you know, um, if, that, if that brought forth resentment. And uh, normally, I may not have a kind of um, interest in that, you know, but more like from reaction to that. And, and I thought, oh, that is a, a good stance, you know, in which to actually approach that, that issue. And I, I feel the same in a way about the grief issue, because grief can mean so many different things. I think there's a kind of sorrow that's attendant on letting go, on change, that uh, many of us are in a state of loss, either a person or a position or a lifestyle or um, so many things, you know, in, in this time of upheaval. And as I think I quoted here once before, I was uh, quoting someone else who said, um, grief is love that doesn't have the ordinary place to land. And that's something that's helped me a lot is looking for the love that is somehow at the heart of that feeling of sorrow and, and grieving and realizing that that's still intact, even though it doesn't have the ordinary place to land. And that also gives me a sense of, of some energy and kind of agency. I think there's another way that we can grieve that does have more to do with uh, what I was talking about is guilt. Um, that is uh, kind of fixating on what one was once there or uh, grieving what we have not accomplished or grieving, um, I know many people, including myself, who had a parent die and it was not a very good relationship, but the grief was for the dream that now would never be. You know, uh, and there are lots of ways in which we can fall into a pattern of, um, just as in guilt, we, we can be kind of stuck in a way that's different than the normal, very natural uh, feeling of sorrow or grief that we might have. And, and it becomes more like bitterness in a way. So I, I think those two are attendant. I think with remorse, with that kind of rightful sense of, oh, that hurts, you know, uh, with regret, with having to let go, with 
uh, so many things. There's a natural grieving process, but I think we can also feel the difference. I can feel the difference, you know, and it, part of it is not blaming yourself for that sorrow and not thinking it's wrong and also noticing when it becomes, um, you know, for me, when it becomes my whole identity and uh, I would resent in those places when I had been there myself, I would resent somebody uh, saying to me, you want to take a walk? I think, no, you know, like, <laughs> I, you know, I have to just sit and stew. Uh, because in the end, I think it's not the suffering that is so redemptive. It's how we relate to the suffering. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I, I, if I could, if I could just say one, one or two things quickly. Um, um, I, so, sorry. Very, we're right at the limit, so very quickly. Okay, just quickly. One of the things I've learned talking with you, Sharon, over this wonderful experience that I've had here is that I'm a crypto Buddhist. And, and so I just want to ask, could you send me a membership card? And are there any dues? Because <laughs> that might be a deal breaker. You've but, paid the dues already, let me say. <laughs> okay. uh, we also now have that recorded. So just, <laughs> just for you both to know. Um, and so maybe I'll just bring us to a close by just saying, this is the end of this particular series. We'll be back in the fall with a year long series that explores inner work in the context of social change. We will be seeing this formidable, funny and extraordinary duo again um, in a few ways through that series. We may publish uh, uh, movie poster type ads for that from, uh, from the 50s and 60s um, as part of just expression, expressing the, um, the, the fondness uh, and appreciation we have for them. I'd love to just bring us to close also by saying um, as we close the series now we'll be looking to do some uh, uh, webinars in regional contexts just to better support what's happening in different parts around the world. Um, so if you're interested in sending this out to friends um, in different places, uh, we'd be really glad for you to do that um, as this moves to that kind of uh, approach. And where we'd love to bring this to a close is just taking a moment to appreciate the community that's come together over the past three months. It's been together in many waves. So taking a moment for that. And as we sign out today, uh, maybe we could turn on our microphones uh, and our cameras one last time. Um, and just say thank you and goodbye to our wonderful two guests, Parker and Sharon. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.